searched all over couldn't find nobody I looked high and low still couldn't find nobody nobody great nobody great nobody greater than you I hope I'm not the only one that feel that way I searched all couldn't find no eye. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. Nobody great, nobody great, nobody greater than you. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Second Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. We're going to look at verse 10 and verse 11. At your leisure, you can read chapter 11 and 12 because it all constitutes the context in which we're coming. But due to limitations we have in time, I'm going to focus my sermonic spotlight only on these two verses. I'm reading from the King James Version. So what you read may sound a little different, may look a little different, but some Bibles are written for translation, from some for interpretation, some for paraphrase. So what we read together, we all should get a greater understanding as we read. And the word of the Lord reads, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress, for Christ's sake. For I am weak, for when I am weak, then... I am strong. I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. I'm going to tag this text with this topic, taking the right perspective. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you use us in this moment, open the, open the soil of our hearts so that we can receive what you have for us in this season. Lord, I ask that you use me in this moment in such a way that no matter what I do, it would bring glory to you. So hide me behind the cross so that as your people look, they will only see your son, Jesus. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and redeemer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God in this assembly. The average human being spends, uh, the average human being responds to suffering uh, by focusing on the problem or focusing on the pain of the problem, or they may respond with fear and sometimes with anger, often with depression. And some will find a completely different focus, will try to look for something positive. I'm not sure how you respond, but I know that we've heard how we should respond. I often quote a small piece of Jesus' first sermon on the, on the Mount, uh, 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 Mount Sinai, where he said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecute they the prophets which were before you. But I'm not sure we understand the meaning of letting our light shine through and in persecution. And I believe that because I've often seen believers who will hear the word respond to circumstances as if they've never heard the word. And so we leave churches because we've been persecuted or we've had some hard times. We turn our backs on purpose because we've been persecuted or we've experienced hard times. We hide from people because we've been persecuted or we've experienced hard time. We become traumatized because we've been persecuted or we've experienced hard time. We become uh, retaliative because we've been persecuted, or because we've experienced hard time. The Bible gives us an indication that when we have hard, when hard times comes, our response should be completely different from how we actually respond. Uh -huh. 
Matthew 5 and 12 says that we should rejoice when persecution comes. James 1 and 2 says we should count it as joy when we go through hard things. Proverbs 3 and 4 said we should trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding, but in all of the hard times, acknowledge God and he'll tell you what to do. Here in the text, Paul says, I take pleasure. Y'all, y'all, y'all going to feel this thing in a minute. How do you rejoice when you're going through hell? How do you find joy when all kinds of stuff keeps happening to you? How do you trust in the Lord when you can't see the possibilities? Maybe Paul can help us in his testimony because the Bible does tell us that, that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of their testimony. And so maybe if we look at Paul's testimony, we will find some joy in our tribulation. In the passage today, Paul is writing to Corinthians church, one of three letters that we know of, but the second of that that is actually available to us. The purpose of this letter had four primary goals in communication. One goal was he wanted to explain why his visit was being delayed to Corinth. The second goal was he wanted to exhort them and to encourage them to forgive a brother who had fallen away in sin and had come back to the church. The third reason he wrote was to enlist their financial support for the church in Jerusalem. And the final reason he wrote was to enforce and, inv- and to validate his apostolic authority. <clears throat> you see, in chapter 12, uh, we find that we are coming to an apex, the climax, the meridian, the pinnacle, the peak of his defense. And here he had, uh, he had to govern this defense because of, of a small influential group that had infiltrated the church. You all know something about that. When you get something done, you put your thing together, you always got haters that show up. And they show up with their own agenda. Somebody tell your neighbor, are you a hater? Somebody is always there to sabotage whatever you're doing for God. And this, was, this is real for Paul. Paul had set this place up. And while doing more of the work, whenever he went out, he found out that somebody had slipped into the camp. And these guys who had come into the camp, they were saying to, that Paul was not a true apostle. They were saying that Paul had mixed motives. They were saying that Paul was ripping them off. And you know how we are. Whenever we hear that somebody's trying to get the best of us, we immediately get to defense. And we don't really know whether the person really is trying to get us. We just need to make sure that they're not going to get us. Because, you know, we were raised with these kind of thoughts. If you get me once, shame on you. But if you get me twice, shame on you. On me Now, although you might like to say that, that is not a godly statement because the Bible says that if someone slaps you on the right side, you got to turn to the left. In other words, you got to make yourself available so that your light can shine. I knew three people wouldn't go say amen to that. In a sense, Paul is saying in this letter, they don't know my story. I know my story. And that's one encouraging statement that I can give to every believer, that it doesn't matter what other folks say about you. They don't know your story like you know your story. It doesn't matter whether they believe in you. They don't know your story like you know your story. Can I say it like this? You don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. In the letter, Paul gives his resume of suffering. He had to let them know, I didn't just get here. I've been through some things. I want you to tell someone near you before they fall asleep. Just tell them, neighbor, I've been through some things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reluctantly recounts his resume of suffering, which included imprisonment, countless beatings, uh, and near-death experiences. Can I run his resume for you? He, he was whipped with 39 lashes on five different occasions. He was beaten with rods on three different occasions. He was pummeled with stones and drugged out of the city and left for dead one time. He was shipwrecked. 
three times. He was adrift at sea one night and one day. He, he had to journey frequently. And y'all know it ain't like when you go on a road trip. When you go on the road trip, you be chilling on the scene with your gangster lean. Woo, woo. And you drive down the street. But when Paul had to go on a journey, Paul had to go in his Chevrolet one foot. After the other, he shoved the left foot and laid the right foot. So it was tedious for him to go from place to place. He was in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, dangers by false brothers, toil in hardship, sleepless nights, hunger and thirsty, cold and exposed, bit by serpents that he shook into the fire, he had gone through some things. Now I know two of you here can relate to going through some stuff. Uh, some of you, you look good right now, but you didn't get here by looking good all the time. You've gone through some stuff. Some of you are dressed up looking good, but they don't remember when you had holes on the bottom of your shoes. I don't know about you, but I know I've gone through some stuff. And I find joy when I understand why I've gone through. Before Paul says, therefore, in chapter 12, verse 10, he explains that although he had special revelation from heaven, he also had a thorn in his flesh with an assignment to keep him humble. After all this stuff, he says, I take pleasure. I take pleasure. I take pleasure in suffering. Just like Paul, we've got a special revelation of the power of Jesus Christ, and we've got a revelation of that, the fact that we have victory in spite of what we're going through. Everybody here have got some issues. I don't care if we're running for office, we got some issues. I don't care if you're balling and shot calling, you've got some issues. I don't care if you're smoother than jello. You've got some issues. Everybody's got some issues. We've got issues, but those issues are there in order to keep us in a place where we will lean and depend on God. We've got failures to keep us humble. We've got imperfections to keep us humble. We've got trouble to keep us humble. We've got, we're a little short on money sometimes just to keep us humble. We have trouble at home just to keep us humble. We got stress in our lives just to keep us humble. We got problems on the left, problems on the right just to keep us humble. We got rejection coming from people just to keep us humble. What do you do? When you've got failure in your life, what do you do when you've got imperfections? What do you do with your trouble or your insufficient supply, the troubles or the stress, the problems or the rejection? What do you do? You've got to learn. <laughs> I like this thing. Y'all don't have to talk to me. I can talk to myself. You got to learn to take pleasure in the hard times. When we have accepted Jesus, here's why. When we've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we face our problems, our issues, our attacks with an embracing of the master's hand. We know that whatever is going on on the outside, God is doing something on the inside. I thought I'd get a better response from the preachers. Let me talk to y'all over here. We know that no matter what hell we're going through, God has us in his hand. Oh, y'all ain't woke yet. Let me try these folk over here. We know that all things work together for good for them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So what do you do brothers and sisters? What do you do with this calamity? What do you do with this problem? What do you do with these tests and these trials? Let me take this word from the scripture. 2 Chronicles 10 and 12 says, therefore I take can I work with that? Therefore, I take. Tell someone near you, therefore, I take. How do you spell take? Okay, T-A-K-E. I'm glad you helped me because I can't spell. I got three doctorate degrees, but I can't spell. All of my dissertations, I had the help of uh, AI and uh, Grammarly. So I can't spell, but I know how to get it done. 
take, T-A-K-E, you got to teach, you've got to act, you've got to keep, and you've got to express. You got to, you got to take, you got to take, you got to take. Let's start with the first thing. I got to teach myself to see why I'm in turmoil. <laughs> I like that. I got to teach myself that there's a reason for my season. I got to teach myself that there's a purpose in my problem. And so here it is in the text. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproach, in necessities, in persecution, in distress. The word take in this passage means uh, to be well pleased, take a great pleasure, a great resolve. To resolve is to find a solution in a sense that no matter what comes my way, I find a solution in God with what's coming my way. It may look hard to you, but I've found a solution in it. Paul explains that in insults, you got to take pleasure. He explained that in hardship, you got to take pleasure. He explains that in difficulties, you got to take pleasure. He explains in persecution, you got to take pleasure because there's a reason for your treason. There's power in your persecution. There's revelation in your rejection. You have to find resolve in, in what you're going through. If we are in the master's hand, God can do something with us. It don't matter what I'm going through because God can do something with my calamity. Y'all look, looking at me funny. Let me see if I can wake you back up. Uh, I heard a story once about this man who was stranded on an island. And he had built his own spot and figured that he would survive because he had a place to live and an abundant supply of food. One day while going out to scounder for food, he came back only to discover that the house he built with the limited amount of, of supply that was available on that island was on fire. And everything he had collected, everything he discovered had caught on fire and was consumed by the fire. Depressed, he walks to the coast and he goes to sleep and sleeps under the stars that night only to wake up that morning with a ship that had docked the side of the island. And the captain comes down and said, we saw your stress signals and we came to pick you up. Come here, church. You don't get it. There are some problems that are going on in your life and all your problems are really doing is sending up stress signals. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift a banner. Won't he make a way for you when trouble comes? Hey God, I feel this thing. <laughs> you got to teach yourself to find power in your problem. The second thing is you got to act. You got to act. You got to say you got to act. You got to act on Christ through Christ. <laughs> you you got to act on Christ, but you're acting through Christ. I'm not talking about the praise team. I know y'all name is through Christ. I'm just saying that everything I do, I got to do it. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me yet. Everything we do, we have to do it through Christ. And so here it is. He says that I take pleasure in infirmities and reproach and necessities and persecution and distress. Watch this. For Christ's sake. The reason we take pleasure is because what we're going through is to bring glory to God. This preposition for is carrying the second definition of the Greek word here. And the second definition is for one's safety, for one's advantage, or for one's benefit. What I go through down here. It's to benefit the glory of God up there. God has a way of making things better if I wait to the end. As I sneak a peek into antiquity, we see the lives of chosen believers who can prove that if you can wait to the end of your problem, you can find some power. Noah spent 80 years preaching a sermon about getting ready for rain only to be delivered by his own sermon on the boat that he built. Abraham lost everything to become a father of a, of a, of a nation that influenced the world even today. Joseph had to be betrayed by his brothers to walk into the blessing or the potential or the purpose that God had given him. Job had to endure trouble 
to experience double. David had to live as an outcast to survive and become king. My question for you is, how are you living today in order to get to what God is calling you to? What kind of trouble are you going through today in order to walk in the potential that God has given you? What kind of pressure do you have on your shoulder to get to the power and the purpose and the potential of what God is calling you to? If we learn to trust God, if we learn to lean on God, if we learn to let God hold you for a little while, we can hold on to see the victory that we have in him. God will show you your problems, but he will also show you the power in the problem. Paul's perspective of every calamity in his life was to take one for the team. In a sense, he keeps his eyes on the purpose even though he had to go through some problems. When you are in Christ, you have to keep that keep on going mentality. When problems come, you got to keep on going. When insults come, you got to act on Christ and keep on going. When persecution come, you got to act on Christ and keep on going. I've learned that God is my GPS. No matter how I get off track, he will get me to my destination. You don't know nothing about a GPS, so let me help you a little bit. I drive from Augusta to Atlanta quite often. My GPS is programmed not only to get me to my destination, but to also avoid traffic when it's going to hold me up. One day I was driving to Atlanta and the traffic was moving just fine. And the GPS told me, get off at the next exit. And I looked at the GPS and said, GPS, you out your mind. The road looks good. I ain't getting off this road. But the Holy Spirit said, get your butt off that road. So I turned to the right, off the road. And as I traveled down on the surface road, there I saw the highway on my left. And eventually, when I looked at the highway, I saw that everybody that stayed on that highway was blocked, trapped, troubled, and stressed. I said, thank you, Lord, <laughs> for giving me another path. Because the path I took didn't look like the right path, but that path got me ahead of the problem. Sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go, but God has a plan. Sometimes you don't get to where you want to go when you want to get there, but God has a plan. Sometimes you had a plan, but your plan was a problem. God had to disrupt your life to get you on another you got to at least know that God will use your problems. He's a GPS in the midst of your problem. The third thing is keep, keep, keep your mind on Christ and not your ability. Let me calm down. Keep your mind on Christ and not your ability. The same scripture says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproach, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. Or when I'm weak. <laughs> that made me shout. It don't make you shout, but it makes me for when I'm weak. Now, Paul says, without Christ in our humanity, we are weak. The literal translation of that says, I might be weak when I'm strong. It is as if Paul is giving, y'all forgive me, saints. Y'all more saved than I am. It's like Paul is giving a Miss Seeley testimony here. In a sense, he's, he, Miss Seeley said, I, I may be black, I may be ugly, but I'm here. Thank God I'm here. And here Paul is saying, I may be weak, but I'm here. Thank God I'm here. And what we're seeing here is in the text is that Paul is not leaning on his ability as a human being. He's leaning on his identity in Christ. And some of you need to learn how to wipe out the identity that you have in your humanity and grab a hold to the identity that you have in Christ. 
Can I work with that a little bit? Your identity in the flesh is you are fatherless, but your identity in Christ is you have a heavenly father. Your identity in the flesh is you are motherless, but your identity in Christ is that you have fulfillment of motherness. Your identity in world is that you're broke, busted, and disgusted, but your identity in God is that you are an inheritor of a cattle on a thousand hills. Your identity in life is that you're sick in your body, but your identity in Christ is that you are healed by his stripes. Your identity in life is that you might be weak, but your identity in Christ is that you are more than a conqueror. I wish I had three people here who could praise God for their identity in Christ. Because if any man leaves in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away Behold, all things have become new. <laughs> I came to church this morning to tell each and every one of you that what others see is only a part of your story. People don't see your calamity. They only sometimes see your victory. But sometimes people don't see your victory. They can only see your calamity. And so people can't be the determining factor of who you really are. They don't know what you had to live through to get here. They don't know why you like to dress nicely now. They don't know why you want to drive the car you're driving because they don't know that you remember when you had to walk most of the way. They don't know why you wear the shoes you wear right now because they can't remember what you had to go through to get where you are can excuse me saints can i say it like i want to say it they don't know your story nor the things that you've been through they can't feel your pain or what you had to go through to get here you know that your worship is for real even when your neighbor said it don't take all that you got a story that says it takes all that and more. And I need five people. I need at least five people who ain't ashamed to come up here and preach with me and stand flat footed in front of this pulpit and testify that you've been through some stuff. But it was not by your power. It was not by your might. It was by the Spirit of God that you made it this far. I need somebody who can say that if it had not been for the Lord on their side, they don't know where they would be. I've got power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And I'm glad you decided to come up here with me because the last point I want to give you is, is that you got to express yourself. I can't be quiet. I know some churches like to be silent. I know some churches like to be gentle. But I'm part of the noisy crew. I like to make noise because I know what I've been through. When Paul gives you this, therefore, he settles with a description and here he says that I glory in God y'all gonna like this last thing he said I glory <laughs> but watch this he said I become a fool and he said here's why I've become a fool I became a fool watch this watch this <laughs> he, I became a fool because you made me do it you, you, you missed it. They were talking about him. So he had to become fool about what God took him through. They didn't believe in him. So he had to become a fool for what God did in his life. And I feel like Paul this morning. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for praying, for healing me. I thank God for blessing me. I thank God for picking me up, turning me around, and placing my feet on solid.
holy breath. Can somebody here say thank you? Thank you! 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 I'm glad, I'm glad that when the father looks at me, he don't see what you see. He sees what he's destined for me and not the path that I'm going. Is there anybody here that have been allowing the pressure of other people's interpretation to snatch you out of your real identity? Oh God. Don't go nowhere. Stay there. Stay there. There's a release for you. Stay. 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 So many of us, we come to church hoping that God would show us that he really cares. The reality is he showed us over 2,000 years ago when he said, I love these folk, these messed up crazy folk, these folk who are stuck in a false identity. I love them so much that I'm going to pay the price that I know they, they don't need, they don't want to pay. They deserve death, but I'll let my son die on their behalf. And now you are the righteousness of God, not because you did what was right but because God did what was right for you. And the next time somebody tries to identify stuff that you're in, you tell them Christ became that for me. You're not going to hold me hostage because I'm being renewed every day. I've got power. I'm more than a conqueror. When someone tries to hold you hostage to being an underachiever, you say, no, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath I know I'm in debt but I'm the lender and not the borrower sometimes you got to speak what God said over your life until it comes to pass and ask God Lord reveal to me how to become what you called me is there anybody who want to be what God called them now I used to be more about membership but right now I'll be honest with you I don't care I'm more about kingdomship now. I want to invite those of you, not to the church, but to the kingdom of God, which means this. You are stepping into a realm of understanding that God owns everything. And this is not prosperity gospel. This is just reality. And because I am a child of God, I am an heir of all that God has given us here. If you want to be that, just come a little bit closer. Just come a little bit closer. We're going to pray over you that God releases an identity that will transform your life. Just rush on. Y'all move on. Come on. You can get as close as you want. I promise you I'll try not to spit. He saw the best in me. When everyone else around could only see the worst. In me. I need y'all to know I could care less what curse some other folks spoke over your life. You are a divine design in the mind of God and you've got to come out of your thinking to become what God has called you. I believe that many of your lives will never be the same after this day. There's a there's a breaking in the atmosphere. God is breaking chains right now I'm gonna ask that y'all anoint these folk I'm gonna pray for them I just want you to anoint to put oil on them this oil is just a symbol that the Holy Spirit is falling on you right now mine I am his it doesn't matter he only sees me for who I am there's some power
power in here right now. Oh, he's mine. I am his. It doesn't matter what I need. He only sees me for who I am. I hear the Lord say that there's a, full, there's a few of you who are feeling like a failure. But I hear in the spirit that God is changing your name. You came in agreement with that identity, but right now your name is changing. You are no longer a failure. You're being activated right now to walk in purpose and on purpose. Just say that he's mine. Say I am his. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to what I did. He only sees me for who I am. Let's go to the throne of grace now, Father. As your people have come to this altar, they have come out of desperation, out of pain, out of suffering. And I hear that you have released a word today that we are not what we're going through. So Lord, I ask that you just pour into their consciousness a true identity. Help them see who they are by your standards. Lord God, I ask now that you put their eyes on an identity as more than a conqueror. You put their eyes on an identity as one who has been reestablished by the power of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And we praise you now for the victory that we have. And no more will we let what was control what is to keep us out of what will be. But we will embrace who we are in you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Let every believer seal their prayer with an amen and a praise to God. Give them glory. Come on in, give them glory. Give them glory. Give them glory. Woo, God. Can y'all sing that again? He's mine. I am his. It doesn't matter what I did. He only sees me for who I am. As you go back to your seat, you just tell your neighbor, just tell him, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. He only sees me for who I am. Oh, he's mine. I am his. It doesn't matter to what I did. He only sees me for who I am. If you were blessed, give God a hand clap of praise. God is saying that some of your lives will never be the same as you embrace the authority that he is pushing you into in this moment. He's pushing, he's pushing, he's pushing, he's pushing. Can I show you something? I've never been comfortable with a push. That means that if God is pushing you, God is going to force some of you out of your comfort zone. But you got to embrace that pushing. I feel like telling you in particular that God is breaking something off of you right now. There's something that's breaking right now. I see it right now. It's breaking. And it's been trying to hold you hostage. But you are free. You are free. God made you free. And God is now opening new opportunities in your life right now. He's breaking chains off of you. And you're about to walk in you gotta trust God as you see these opportunities you gotta walk in it like a boss you gotta kick the door in and you gotta act like you're already there that's the kind of faith that God requires for your next steps I am his it doesn't matter to what I did ha. he only sees me for now I am. the altar will not close 
we're a radical church. We don't believe in closing the altar just because we gave you a benediction. If you feel like you need to connect more intimately with God, if you feel like you need prayer, if you want to connect with this church under Christian experience, under watch care, or even as a new convert, just walk up here and these elders will start you on your next journey with God. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father, I thank you for every single thing you've done today, the word you've given, and even the challenge that we have to walk more intentionally with you. And so, Father, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we ask that you allow the power of your grace and the manifestation of your sweet holy communion to rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, and may the peace of God be with you. stop for all things MCOG. Follow all MCOG calendar events, listen to Merit Moments, Wisdom Wednesday, and Sermons, Tithes and Offering through Givelify, Sunday Resources and Prayer Request. Learn about us and how to locate us. Get the latest communication through email and text. Watch all services live. See member testimonials. Learn what we are about. See what we believe. Meet the leadership team. Church of Grovetown is a place where families can be educated, empowered, and equipped by the love of Jesus to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. Located in the heart of Grovetown, we have the strengthening of families in our heart. From our fully staffed children's and students' ministry to powerful worship and impactful preaching and teaching, we believe you and your family will find meaningful ways to connect with our family and God. Worship with us in person or virtually at mcogfamily.org. Church of Grovetown is a place where families can be educated, empowered, and equipped by the love of Jesus to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. Located in the heart of Grovetown, we have the strengthening of families in our heart. From our fully staffed children's and students' ministry to powerful worship and impactful preaching and teaching, we believe you and your family will find meaningful ways to connect with our family and God. Worship with us in person or virtually at mcogfamily.org. Welcome to the fourth annual Bishop Isaias Merit Scholarship event. This year we're gathering on November 2nd at the magnificent Marriott Convention Center, right at the heart of Augusta, Georgia. As the sun goes down at six in the evening, we'll light up the night with energy, laughter, and the joy of giving. The Bishop Isaias Merit Scholarship is more than just a giveaway. It's a mission, a commitment to restoring earthly families to a godly glory through the power of education, we believe in emancipation through knowledge and empowerment through learning. And this scholarship is our way of making that belief a reality. So join us in celebrating the transformative power of education. Let's make a difference one scholarship at a time. Unleash your spirit, share the laughter, and let's create a brighter future together at the fourth annual Bishop Isaias Merit Scholarship event. See you there.
Play some music and you can dance the night away. Just